interview with famed game designer Shigeru Miyamoto, he mentions the prominence of black backgrounds in video games at the time, and how his inspiration for Super Mario Bros. came as a response to all this. He goes on to say, The theme of Super Mario Bros. was the blue sky. Super Mario Clouds is a new media art piece by American artist Cory Archangel, which he describes as an old Super Mario Bros. cartridge, which modified to erase everything but the clouds. All the gameplay and assets have been erased, stripping it bare and leaving behind only the glowing blue palette of the game's skied background, a pure distillation of Miyamoto's original vision. With its 8-bit jagged clouds the only thing left to remind the viewer of its origins. Display of Archangel's piece seems to change depending on the circumstances, sometimes shown with multiple screen projections, other times with a simple, single CRT TV. But the core of the work is the hacked game cartridge playing out a real-time video feed off of an old Nintendo system. The most recognizable setup of the work seems to be its exhibition at the Whitney Museum, where dual projectors displayed asymmetrically sized video feed onto two perpendicular walls, while off to the side, an old TV set hooked up to an NES console, runs the hacked cartridge. Screens here take over for the traditional canvas, and the electronics are all placed casually on the floor, as if sculptural elements. The connecting cables that power everything are strewn across the room in a mess replicating a middle-class living room sometime in the late 80s or early 90s. Part video art, part sculpture, part time capsule. In multiple interviews, Archangel mentions his fascination with things, with cultural artifacts. All this digital plastic ephemera faded to be forgotten, now that we have the ability to churn it out at a rapid rate. We manufacture ourselves into the future and make our past obsolete, finding ourselves standing atop mounds of late capitalist debris. Rather than critiquing or satirizing this environment, Archangel seems to prefer to dig up and expose what's underneath. Whether it be physical objects or cultural signifiers, he enjoys playing the part of a historian or archaeologist, preserving things for future contemplation while playing with their given contexts within the same moment. With Schrodinger's cat, no observer is without their own effects on what they are observing. And with Archangel, observation tends to bleed into the interventional. Digging up new old things, he takes it a step further and starts to wonder at the inherent qualities within the objects, using his art practice to curate and manipulate them into new points of view. Like with Duchamp's urinal, placed in a gallery space to alter the idea of the encounter, a strategy that can reaffix objects with new ideas and reframe perspectives held by the viewer, the medium of the video screen becomes a new sight, altered through its artistic intervention. A place where something like a video game and its hardware, made originally for entertainment and profit, can be thought about in broader terms. We can ask ourselves, what else can we learn from things? Archangel takes his raw material from Miyamoto's game, but the mechanics that he codes into the work has its genetic copy in the history of conceptual art, adding his name alongside Namjoon Pike and Robert Rauschenberg, two other artists equally fascinated by the crossroads of image, media, and concept. In Namjoon Pike's case, a similar approach to absence was put to use for his Zen for Film, a short film composed of an unused strip of celluloid. The film shows the viewer nothing but scratches and dust flickering across its empty white light background, markings made not by the artist's hand, but by the passage of time and the impermanence inherent to material forms. Junpike didn't film anything on the film strip. The frame, just as with Archangel's clouds, empties out the image plane for a farcical take on spirituality and media. The zen calming quality of the electronic blue sky works similarly to Pike's own purity of form in the underexposed film stock. It's freedom from the image. It's reality truth, showing no illusion of space, only its present physical state.
Rauschenberg's Erase de Kooning, a conceptual drawing consisting of the action of erasure, sees a drawing of charcoal, oil paint, pencil, and crayon by established painter William de Kooning, erased with great effort by the young artist. In an anecdote about the work, Rauschenberg tells us that, after explaining the idea to the skeptical de Kooning, the artist went flipping through his collections of drawings, finally choosing one for the younger artist to use with the challenge, these are the drawings I would miss. Now I'm going to give you one really hard to erase. The act of erasing can be seen as a form of drawing, an inverse of the mark-making process, but still tied to the same idea. Turning back the hours while still moving forward, it's a confrontation, a creation. Erasing the work of a highly regarded artist, de Kooning, Miyamoto, erases something with cultural value and produces something out of that context. Nothing exists in a vacuum. In the removal, we see how everything requires cable connectors to power its meaning. If Rauschenberg had erased a drawing by someone else, our response, whether of contemplation or outrage, would alter accordingly. Super Mario without Mario is no longer a game, and that means something. The title of the pieces choose to remind us specifically about what they used to be, and provides a moment to think over the consequences of the now emptied plane, leaving a framed piece of blank paper with the faintest remains of its original markings, labeled below quite clearly Erased de Kooning Drawing, Robert Rauschenberg, 1953. Art can help to open up a space for catharsis, which for me is an admirable and undervalued experience that can be evoked by a work. The humor of the pieces I've just talked about now are ironic comedy bits. They're all gags. Humor has a great ability to relieve growing tensions that are poisoning the mind. Art can play a great part in that as well, playfully asking the viewer more questions than providing answers. A joke can reframe a perspective of a thing and release the hold it has over us. Curiosity is an important part of the process for artists as much as viewers. They're looking for a reaction by breaking out of the illusionary and into the realm of the real and often absurd world. Art, in a lot of cases, can be about situating a viewer in a context and having them play around in that new space. The difference between art and games is how they swap museum spaces for power cables and aesthetic ideas for green and red shells. Like its predecessors, Super Mario Clouds is about emptying out. I think, to some degree, what makes it so effective is its use of a medium of high stimulation and engagement, and then deleting all of that. Again, it's cathartic. It's relaxing. Miyamoto's statement about the thematic clouds becomes a bit comical once we see the rest of the game set aside to pursue this idea to its logical conclusion. Archangel's joke with the piece lies in how much video games are meant as a medium of interaction, and the artist robs us of that agency inherent to it. The zenness of the clouds puts one in a state of almost one-mindedness. We're detached from the world of things and needs. There are no timers, no goals to accomplish, no coins to collect or dangers to avoid. There is nothing to master. There's just the viewer left by themselves with their own thoughts. The quiet contemplation of a word, a moment, a pixelated cloud, maybe a memory the unfamiliar within the familiar, where we search the emptied space for what's missing. We can find a union of a certain subjective self with an assured objective reality. These are clouds, and I am me. So now what? I like to think of the absence of Mario as an invitation for the player to embody the role themselves. Art can teach us how to live, whether it be the poetry of Homer or the films, books, and games of our own time. Narratives have given us a frame for our worldly being. The endless human drama where identity plays itself out amongst numerous other parts, like a video game with its mechanics playing off one another, provide a ludic space for experimentation and exploration. This time, however, instead of jumping from pipe to platform, the action is an inward figurative one, jumping from thought to thought, inwardly exploring our own physical and psychological space. Art as a way to discover and cope with who you are, an anxious and uncomfortable ball running through a world of dangers and time limits, feeling both at times helpless and overwhelmed, and at others quite empowered and accomplished. We grow through experiences, but we also need to occasionally self-reflect. We can't always keep running. So we took out the photographic image, took away the drawing, and removed the gameplay from the game. What we are left with is a surface abyss to fall into, a frame without its painting, with no narrative to hold onto or distract from actual fact. 
the absence opens up a negative space, a reversal of the painting with all its learned perspective, color, and light. There is more to pictorial or imagined spaces than just their surfaces, edges, and marks. The Renaissance sought to load up the canvas with realism and embedded textual meanings. We, losing ourselves in their illusionistic worlds, they became dense webs of meaning and instruction, as well as witnesses to the glory of creation or higher religious reality beyond our own physical world, like the invisible code that's stored up in small microchips, giving rules that define Mario's world, providing him with meaning and purpose. With technique began the obsession with realism, beauty, and narrative life. We've got to learn that emptiness has its own currency, even if made invisible, like so many erased 8-bit coins. Nintendo put together its original entertainment system with the idea of cornering the market on the nascent media of home gaming. The work of designers and programmers was an equal feat of ingenuity and skill, crafting smooth running fantasy worlds around some shocking technical limitations. After all, Super Mario Bros. fits its entire game, from graphics to sound to gameplay, level maps, intro screens and animations, all within a meager 31 kilobytes. In its own way, the clever tricks used, like palette swapping assets or limiting the player's ability to turn around, an action which would take up too much space and memory if it were permitted, echoes the design philosophy of what Archangel would later pull out with his hack. Do more with less. We are always being steeped in content and context in the information age. Data rains down on us like storm clouds. Here, a hacked cartridge allows us to break with this input without avoiding it. It actively pushes us out in order to empty out our registries. It can sometimes be taxing on the system to have all that data stored up in memory. Stepping back to observe the reality that we occupy as it flashes by our screens, to see the objects that surround us, to ask ourselves what they mean and what we mean to ourselves, Unlike Mario, we are able to turn back, to contemplate, to understand. We ask ourselves questions like why, and marvel at the what that's all around us. It's a great game of inversion, where by emptying out the frame, we end up providing it with a richer set of meanings and possibilities, latent in our own overly active minds. Painting in our own contexts and subjective memories, our own games and objectives, we are able to look better at ourselves and meditate over the media that we engage with. If we're lucky, maybe we can even find a hidden part of ourselves. What I'm trying to say is, in the right circumstances, absence is presence. Like the line about jazz, sometimes it's all about the notes you're not playing. Thank you.